let's start with the wound. Um, uh, well, I, I came out of there three weeks late at 10 pounds and five ounces. So I think that's where my mom's grudge started, <laughs> is at birth. She was pregnant. Uh, she had taken my dad to work and then just never went back and got him. She was my savior and also my tormentor at the same time. We did everything. We celebrated Christmas. We had birthdays. I had, you know, had family that we got to hang around. Um, um, and then all of that, once we got into Pentecostal church, all that stopped because we had to separate ourselves from the world because they didn't have the truth. Right as she was getting into the Pentecostal church, she became very ill and she, they thought she might die. She put me in a children's home to assure my salvation, basically, because the all of our blood family was not Pentecostal. They did not believe what she considered to be the truth. That was a big um, ordeal. So she felt very strongly, obviously, about it, sending me three states away from where I wouldn't be able to have any contact with any family. Mom gets disgruntled with the way the church stuff goes and we leave. And we go to another church a few, um, a few towns over. And my mom meets a guy who ends up being my stepdad. Um, oh, he was so handsome and he showed me how to play guitar. Um, I called him daddy. I changed my name to fit his. I, on my school papers, I was so excited because I was such a tomboy and man, I got a dad and I was excited. And everything, well, was good for a minute. He decides he's gonna get out of church. They get married, he starts drinking and we find out his other side, the flip side of him without God, which was very, traumatic. He's an alcoholic and abusive and, you know, would beat and bang on mom and she'd beat and bang on me. He's <laughs> like, I'd kick the cat, so it just kept it going. Um, uh, then they ended up having the first baby and he decided that he needed to go back to God because now he's got another child. He's already had two by his first wife. He and mom decide that they're going to get back in church. We're going to be a family unit, but he's got to preach the gospel because he's got a call on his life. So, okay. So we pick up the little family and we go from North Carolina to Sarasota, Florida. I'm 13 and I'm big for my age. I look like a full grown woman. You know, I got the, I got the boobs. I got the jean skirt. I got the, you know, my stepdad invited me into the church house and sat me on the front row and we were talking and he's explaining to me how I should, I'm starting to get to a dating age and how um, there are things that I should do as a Christian lady and there are things that I shouldn't do. And then he shows me these things that he, that I should and shouldn't do and he plays them out completely. You know, and this is a man that I trust. And he's also a pastor. So I um, also remember kneeling on that very altar right in front of that front pew where that conversation and those things happen and asking God to forgive me for what had just happened. Because somehow it just didn't feel, just didn't feel quite right. And I'm dumb, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a kid and I've been sheltered. I don't know stuff. I've never even been around a, a, a man, my mom, a, there were, there weren't men in and out of my life like that. So I figured if she trusted him, surely I should, you know, trust him too. And um, over the course of, you know, a little bit of time, um, I, I was having full-fledged sex. So 13, I'm pregnant. There was a, an episode at a gas station bathroom where I fully believe I, had a miscarriage. Ended up in a house for battered women because he was beating and banging on my mom. A lady befriended me. I was wired to not talk to people. You don't tell people your business. You don't talk to strangers. And here I'm being introduced to social workers and, and all kinds of worldly people. And she just started talking to me. She basically asked if my stepdad had ever 
touch me or whatever. And I just innocent told her, you know, what was going on or what had happened, just telling my little story. She went directly to my mom, and my mom loses her mind at me. <laughs> She's mad at me. And she says that that is a horrible accusation to make. He could lose his ministry. And uh, now we're, <laughs> we're staying at a house for battered women um, because, you know, he beat the Stephens out of her, but it's his ministry that we're worried about because the gospel is what's more important than anything else. She decides that I might be lying. So she takes me to the downstairs basement area and she makes me draw a picture of his stuff and describe it to her so I, she could know that I was being, you know, honest or not lying on him. And then I did what she asked and she was furious, but she was mad at me. She was mad at him. She was just mad at the world. She was pregnant. <laughs> I had probably just miscarried myself, and I'm telling her now that he's done this. So I'm sure she's in a pickle. So she calls him up. She tells him what I've accused him of. He denies it. She makes me get on the phone and confront him. And he says to me that I'm lying and I, that, that never happened or whatever. I'm confused. Um, she is beside her. She's screaming and crying and banging the steering wheel and just pulling her hair and just losing her mind. And I'm, I don't even know what's happening. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrifying. So there was no definitive answer as to whether he had done something. So she takes me to get a lie detector test and she's reading the paper. Now she is concerned about his ministry. She wants to be very sure that there is no doubt before she brings this accusation against him publicly. So she reads the lie detector test and apparently it did not have the exact questions on it that she wanted. So, I don't know if you've ever shit paper before, but she made me eat that lie detector test. Now, she wasn't a complete savage. She tore it up in little pieces, but I ate that lie detector test, and I had to go back in that building and take another one, and they had to ask me more specific questions, and that one apparently led her to believe that I was telling the truth. She's like, I will protect you. I won't let him have any contact with you. Um, I'm going to get us out of this, is what she said. So we're stuck for another year. What happens is we are living with him and his mom. His mom is also a Pentecostal preacher. She gets wind, his mom gets wind of what has happened. She gets me alone in the house, and she looks up in my eyes and she points her finger up at my face and she says, I know what Rusty's doing to you, but he don't have the Holy Ghost right now, so he's not accountable is what she told me. And uh, so I right quick knew that, you know, he was going to be protected. When we finally got up enough courage to leave, we literally packed our car, everything that we could get in the car, and we fled. And for years we lived in the terror of him finding us, coming and stealing his younger children. But what ended up happening is she made him, she basically sold my virginity for an uncontested divorce and two hodlers. I don't know what the going price is these days, but that's what it was back in 84. I should by all stretch of any imagination be like a serial killer or, or something crazy after what I've been through. I didn't even realize what my mom had done. I, I love, I, I was like, my relationship with my mom was totally crazy. Like, 
I loved her with life. I would have exchanged places. When she was on her deathbed, I would have gladly exchanged places. It just had a warped, a warped love there. It, it was what she had created. There were lots of beatings. Um, you know, the time I slicked my hair down because um, I was gonna go play baseball, I put some grease on my hair to make it lay down and my mom beat the stew out of me. You wanna act like a man, I'll treat you like a man. But then she bought me a ball glove and a, and boxing gloves and a guitar and a fire truck and a G.I. Joe and a Jeep and a dirt bike. And I'm like, okay, I'm ball cap, gun and holster, cowboy boots, I'm confused. In her mind, she was saving me from hell. Um, because the gay, you know, she knew very early. And I think she loved me the best, 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 best that she could, you know. And she got to die at 52. Last thing she said was, I sat there with her, and she was like, she'd lived her life for God all those years. And you would have thought, you would have thought, that she would have been so proud of those years. But all she could say to me in, in those frail last few moments, she said, there's so much I wanted to do. She didn't say how much she loved living for God. She said, there's so much I wanted to do. And that just struck me. Even then, it just, it, it has lingered with me all these years. And it wasn't, her fight for living for God and and it wasn't that she was sorry for all the beatings and all the you know the toy but there was just so much that she didn't get to do I want to celebrate making it past her um, the fear that I lived in for a very long time about dying young and I forgot that I should actually live during that time and I have spent the last um, the last four years living as fully and as authentically as I humanly and possibly can. And um, I'm doing it uh, basically against everything that I was taught, everything that I was raised to hold dear. And it has been the most amazing four years of my life.